Hello, welcome to our live Q&A about bees. I'm Dr. Tanya Laddie. I'm an entomologist from the University of Sydney, and this is urban beekeeper Doug Purdy. Hello. In tonight's program, The Great Australian Bee Challenge, we worked with four amateur families to teach them not only how to keep honeybees, but all about the fascinating ways that bees communicate and behave. So please send us your questions, just write them in the comments below. I'll start with a question of mine. Doug, what do you think the best part, most enjoyable part of working on the program was? Oh wow, it's a good question. You know, my favourite part of the, of the program was teaching these you know, families how to become beekeepers because going from nothing to actually producing honey is awesome. So that's my best, my best part for sure. <laughs> that's great. I think from my perspective it was so much fun to be able to go out and just talk about bees and have people <laughs> get really excited about bees. Um, yeah, it was heaps fun. And to go around and visit some of Australia's great bee scientists and have a chance to talk to them too. It's fantastic. You were buzzing? <laughs> I was buzzing with excitement, you could say. Excellent. <laughs> All right, we've got a, another question. Oh, this is a good one. Why should we care about bees? Wow. I, well, yeah, bees are really important, right? So, so like, I like eating, and, um, and so food is important for me to be able to do that. <laughs> And if we don't have bees, we don't have pollinators. So a lot of our food requires pollination to either produce you know, big, strong crops or nice shaped fruit. And, um, and so bees are important in that pollinator role. Mm -hmm. And that includes native plants as well. So it's not just mm. about crops. It's about supporting our whole ecosystem by having these insects. Because most flowering plants need an insect to pollinate them. So they're super important. And I like eating. And eating is good. Food is great. Yeah. Almost all the delicious things are insect pollinated. So you know, they're very important. Okay, um, this is a question from Karina on YouTube. Does honey expire? Oh wow, good question. You know, honey doesn't have an expiry date. It's it's awesome. It's um it's once the bees make it and it's sealed up in the in the wax cabs, it will stay like that forever. And um and you probably know this, but you know they found they found honey in Egyptian tombs that was apparently edible. That's... I wouldn't have tasted it, but it was apparently <laughs> edible. <laughs> And should people be concerned when they get crystals in their honey or when it starts to look a little bit different than when they first bought it? Oh, yeah, well, no, no. Look, honey goes, it can, it's called candying, you know, when it crystallises. And that usually means that it's actually a good honey. It's not honey that's been fiddled with in some way. So, so candying of honey just means it's good. Oh, so crystals are good. Yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, we've got another question from Peter who asks, I'm a complete novice. How do you recommend getting started? Wow, okay. Um, look, Join a bee club. That's the best thing you can do. Bee clubs are full of awesome beekeepers and always you'll find a mentor and all the information you need to get started. But don't just go and buy a beehive and try and do it without some experience. All right. Amelia on Facebook is asking, can you keep bees if you only have a small outdoor space? Wow, I think you should answer this one. Well, I'm going to say if you've got a small outdoor space, really consider looking into Australian native stingless bees. They can. They need a lot less space. They're not stinging, so you don't have to worry too much about being in really close proximity to your bees. So if you can get access to stingless bees, that would be my recommendation. And they're very cute. Oh, they're adorable little bees. All right. What is the main difference between a native bee and a European honeybee? Oh, oh. I think I'm going to take this one. Go for it. Well, we have oh, more than 2,000 different species of native bee here in Australia. So there's heaps and heaps of different kinds. Uh, and they're very different from one another. There are fuzzy teddy bear bees, which are adorable, puffy little bees that fly around, to teeny tiny little things like stingless bees, which almost look like flies, uh, if you don't know what to look for. Most of our native bees are solitary. So instead of living in really big hives, they live as individuals. So you'll have one little mommy bee living with her baby bees, um, maybe in a piece of wood or in mortar or in soil, depending on the species. So there's lots of lots of differences between native bees and honeybees. Um, one of the big differences is that honeybees, uh, like their name suggests, they produce heaps of honey. Mm. So it's a great thing about being able to keep honeybees, you get lots of honey. Our native stingless bees also produce honey, but not quite as much as European honeybees. Other thing there is that most of our um, most of our native bees actually sting. Mm. So everybody seems to think that the only bees that sting are European honeybees, but that's not true. Most of our natives have stingers. There's only a few that don't. They just don't use them very often. Mm. They're very chill bees, our native bees, and, yeah. and partly because they're not defending a big hive. So you don't tend to get heaps of bees coming out to get you all at once. Not that that happens particularly <laughs> regularly with honeybees, um, but it's a little bit easier to work with them. I, mean, I know very few people who've been stung by a native bee. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, next question is from Hannah. Uh, and Hannah asks, are bees in danger in Australia? Gosh, well, it depends what you mean by in danger. You know, we have a problem in general in Australia with deforestation and overuse of chemicals. So um, those things are putting not just our bees, but all our beneficial insects at risk. So to answer that question, I think we need to plant more bee forage plants and use less insecticide, and those things will help everything. Mm -hmm. Like, it'll help our birds, it'll help our, our insects, it'll help everything. So that's what we need to do. Yep, absolutely. And often when we hear questions like that, um, bee is a big term, so yeah. there's honeybees, but then there are, are native bees, and we don't actually have good records for long-term population information about our native bees, so we can't even put a number on to whether they're going up or down or staying the same. Unfortunately, most likely they're going yeah. down, and that that's mirrors places all over the world. Native bees um, tend to be decreasing, and just as you said, plant lots of flowers, making sure we limit deforestation, limiting insecticide use, all of these things can help. Yeah, no more sides. So all the sides, insecticides, herbicides, the whole lot, just stop using them. Let's see, Belinda is asking, do different bees or different trees uh, make different flavoured honey? So can you get different types of honey from different yeah. types of bees or from different types of trees? Yeah, we can. And, um, and that's what's interesting. So, so you'll see, you know, if you go to the shops and you see um, know, yellow box honey, that comes just from the yellow box tree. So uh, it is possible to do that. But most urban honeys come from multifloral environments. So you'll get all these different flavours in the honey, which is what makes it really, really interesting. Great. Our next question is from Julie, who asks, can you have stingless bees in Victoria? Oh, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, Julie. <laughs> um, probably not. Victoria is pretty cold. None of our native stingless bees go that far south, so they're pretty much, Sydney's getting even towards the edge of their distribution. So, no, naturally you can't have stingless bees there. Um, but if you want to have lots of bees in your garden or your area, again, just plant lots of flowers. You'd be amazed at how many different species you'll have turning up if you have the flowers there for them to come to. Maybe, maybe a bee hotel. Bee hotels are yeah. another good way to do it. So, you can go online and look for bee hotels. There's heaps of different designs, but most of them consist of a wooden block with holes drilled into it, um, tubes, so hollow pieces of wood, even some old crumbly brick brickwork um, yeah. can work really well, and you'll get bees coming to nest there. So you won't get hives of bees, you'll get individual solitary bees, but it can be so, so rewarding just to watch those insects show up and just stare at them doing their day-to-day. -day. And who doesn't like a blue-banded bee? Oh, blue-bandeds are the best. <laughs> you have so many great bees. Okay, uh, Tony asks, native bees thrive in Newcastle, New South Wales. I have two hives, uh, and I'm thinking about getting up to three. Wow, that's great, Tony. It's, it's, it's awesome to have native bees. Um, what you've got to watch is you don't want to have too many hives close together because they can fight. Um, but other than that, that's awesome. Good on you. Yeah, it's wonderful when you can keep native bees and keep them going. Yeah. So, well done. Ah, on Facebook, someone would like to know, what is the number one killer of bees in Australian environment? Is it man or is it things like drought and climate change? Um, it's neither. It's a disease called American fowl brood. So we unfortunately have a, a viral disease here in Australia that we don't know how it came here and that kills more bees than anything else. Second to that, it'd be probably loss of, of habitat. You know, um, there's a lot of problems with loss of habitat. It's affecting all of our insects. <laughs> Doug, we have a, a very important comment here for you. Uh, people love your shirt. Ah, excellent. <laughs> well, you can't have it. Sorry. Um, yeah, I do have a collection of bee shirts. <laughs> it's a very important thing about being a bee researcher or a bee person who works yes. with bees. You've got to have the bee swag. Yes. T T Tanya has a fair collection of bee skirts and shirts as they well. They say it's a blue banded bee shirt here, you know, just representing the native bees. And a spider skirt. Just <laughs> and a spider, you know, right. predators, pollinators, all the beneficials are happening here. <laughs> Um, Chris asks, we're in Queensland. Our neighbour has honeybees. Are we able to have a native beehive? I think they're worried about competition oh, okay. between the natives yeah. and the honeybees. Yeah, totally. Um, so native bees and, and European honeybees get along just fine. Um, in fact, the native bees tolerate the European honeybees less than the other <laughs> way around. So we've often found native bees nicking things out of the European honeybee hives, <laughs> but not the other way they'll kill them. Um, so absolutely, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. When we've watched sometimes bees on flowers, you'll see a honeybee sitting there foraging and a little tiny stingless bee will yeah. come and just start nibbling on the bees, the honeybee's legs and she'll fly away. Yeah. So native bees can hold their own. They're tough. Ah, Colin from Canada. Hey, I'm from Canada too. Awesome. <laughs> it says, I've noticed a decline in native bee species in my area. I live in southern Ontario, Canada. 
oh, wow, it's my hometown. Well done. <laughs> I've also noticed an increase in wasp populations as well. I know their food sources aren't the same, but do you think this could be related? So it sounds like you're concerned that the wasp population might be having an impact on the native bees in, in Canada. Probably not. They don't really feed on the same thing. So it's hard to say without knowing exactly which wasp you have, but I'm guessing they're sort of yellow and black European wasps, which used to be a huge problem, at least when I lived mm. in southern Ontario. Um, they're feeding on protein, mostly from meat. Um, they're predators, so they're not eating the same things as bees are at all. Um, bee populations can fluctuate. They can be up some years, down other years, and it's really hard to know whether those things are related. So probably not influencing one another, um, but it's hard to say what is causing a decrease or increase in bees. And we get the same question here um, about the paper wasps, whether mm -hmm. the paper wasps are turning up because there's beehives, and hey, who knows? It could just be this year there's lots of paper wasps. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, wasps often get a bit of a bad rap, but wasps yeah. are awesome too. They're great to have in your garden. They kill things like caterpillars and things that are eating your plants. So, you know, no, no wasp hatred. They're great. <laughs> you know, oh, we totally. should encourage them as well. Yeah. Uh, Jessica is asking, how do native bees improve the biodiversity of an area? Ah. Over to you. <laughs> okay, well, when we say the word biodiversity, what we're talking about is having lots of different species in an area. So when you have lots of different species of native bees, automatically you're increasing the insect biodiversity. But there's also effects for plants because different bee species will pollinate different native plants. And so if you have a large variety of bees, then you have a bigger variety of healthy plants that are able to reproduce. So having lots of native bees in an area is a great thing for biodiversity just in general. Ah, on Facebook, Sam is asking, I want to have bees, but how much sun do they need? I'm near Bega with big trees around my property, and I have no shortage of shade in the winter. Yeah, look, I mean, bees need about as much sun as chooks. So there's a few sort of rules of thumb, and one is that in winter, as much sun as you can possibly give them, and in summer, you know, not the hot afternoon sun, because they, they overheat. So it's a, but the thing is bigger, it's pretty cool during, in winter in Bega. Um, could be tricky, you want to make sure they've got some decent sun, otherwise they can get all sorts of fungal diseases because they get cold and wet. Mm -hmm. Ah, Luke has asked, if I live in Canberra, is there any point in building a bee hotel? Yes! Yeah, totally! Yes, go for it! Yeah. <laughs> There's no reason at all you can't have a bee hotel in Canberra. Canberra has native bees, uh, lots of different solitary species, so have a play and see what shows up. There's no real rule to building a bee hotel. You need to experiment to see what the bees in your area you know, will like, so go for it. In fact, there's an awesome um, bee hotel in the Botanic Gardens in Canberra. It's <gasps> absolutely massive. So go and have a look at that one. You can get some inspiration. Uh, Violet is asking, how much space around the hive do you need um, free from human traffic? Can it be near my clothesline? <laughs> okay, well, it depends. If you like polka dot clothing, <laughs> then you put the beehive right beside your clothesline because what bees do is as they leave the beehive, they poo. And bee poo is generally yellow because they eat pollen. And so you get yellow dots all over your clothes. So that's not going to work very well unless you have lots of yellow dotted clothes. Um, what you want to do is not put it where you're walking all the time, you know, because bees generally are passive, but like all of us, they can have a bad day. And um, if you've got to walk past the beehive all the time, not a good idea. So you want to have it a little way away. But there is a trick, and the, the trick is you can put up a screen so the bees uh, fly up and away from the beehive. So about two and a half metres is their cruising height. Get them up there and they'll continue off at that height, which is above most people's heads. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. A shell has a question. To attract bees, my few lavenders have been good. Uh, are around grevilleas good? So I guess a grevillea is a good food yeah. plant for bees. Yeah, totally. Grevilleas are great. If you shake a lot of grevilleas, you'll see all the nectar coming out of them. Um, so for, um, not for European honeybees, but for the native bees and other native insects, grevilleas are awesome. But there's a whole host of, of different plants that you can plant. Um, so really, if you want to plant natives, just go to the local native nursery and they can tell you what's sort of suitable for your area. Oh, we've got a great follow-on question. Fiona asks, do native bees need native plants or are they just as happy with any flowers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, so there are some native bees that are specific to particular flowers. So they're, they're specialists. They'll only feed on particular native plants. But there are also lots of species like blue-banded bees and teddy bear mm. bees and to some extent stingless bees that are happy on almost the same thing that honeybees are on. So what I usually recommend to people is if you want to attract bees and support them, plant a variety of flowers. Aim to have big patches of flowers, so it's a big 
target, a big signal for the bees to know, right, there's food here. Uh, and aim for things to be flowering all year round, or at least as much coverage as you can get. That way there's always something in flower. And if you have a mix of native plants and um, non-native plants that produce lots of nectar and pollen, then that's great too. Uh, a lot of this is experimenting with the bees mm. in your area. So plant stuff, keep track of what things, which things are working, and just go from there. It's all sort of a work in progress. And there's heaps of resources online uh, about plants that people think are good for bees. Um, there's not a lot of research on specifically which ones to plant, so you know, go for it, experiment, have fun, see what works. Throw away the mower. And throw away your mower, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Weeds, I know people don't like weeds, but a lot of weeds are actually quite good for, for bees. So having weeds around can be a good thing as well. I like weeds. Weeds are good. <laughs> oh, we've got a question from Paolo on YouTube. What should I do if wasps nest about 10 meters from a bee box? Uh, he says, thanks for inspiring more people on beekeeping. Oh, thank you. Well, I suppose he might be talking about European wasps, mm. right? So it depends where you are in Australia. Some places, the colder areas have European wasps. Um, they're bad news. They're bad news for humans and for bees because they, they actually eat the bees as they come out of the oh. beehive. Um, if they're European wasps, you get rid of them because they're no good. Um, if they're other wasps, it shouldn't be a drama. So they should be quite happy and should coexist you know, perfectly. The European wasps are a problem. Hmm. Yep. Uh, Lee has an interesting question. What determines the colour of wax on my frames? My Italian yeah. bees make a white, a white wax and a wild swarm I caught has butter yellow wax. Is it bee genetics? Yeah, it's really interesting. Sure. At the moment there's some really, really yellow wax coming out and no one seems to know why and it's different parts of Australia right. have got it. So Queensland and we've seen it here in New South Wales. Um, look, it, it's supposed to be the forage that the bees are foraging mm. on. Um, but who knows? I actually don't know the answer to that question. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. We're, we're stumped. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Monica has a couple blue banded bees in her garden. Yay, great. Love blue bandits. They're my favorites. Uh, if I buy seedlings or bigger plants that are grown commercially in order to provide food for the bees, yeah. mm, should I worry about insecticides, yep. pesticides that are used in the production of those seedlings? And oh, plants? totally. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard to get away. I, if you're a flower shop, then often insecticides are applied to prevent them from getting eaten by things in the production process. Um, it can be tricky. Uh, you're probably best, if you can, to grow things from seed. Um, having said that, I often buy plants from nurseries, and I haven't yet had a problem, but it's, it's such a hard thing to know whether yeah. it's having an impact or not. Well, the problem is the systemic pesticides. Mm. So some of them um, make the whole plant toxic, and it's great for a nursery because the plants look great, don't mm. they? But ask the question, ask the nursery. You know, Some of them will tell you, and if they're prepared to tell you, then maybe they're the ones to go, go yeah. for. Uh, Jason asks, wondering what's the best technique to prepare bees for winter and when do we do it? I'm in Melbourne. Wow, well Melbourne's, Victoria's had a drowsy <coughs> bee season this year, um, so you want to make sure they've got enough food. Now everywhere in Australia it's different, so that's where bee clubs can help you. They can mm. tell you how much food they're leaving behind for their bees. Here in Sydney I usually leave about four frames of honey, which is quite a lot, um, but Ask a local beekeeper or your local bee club how much you should leave. And um, it's usually something to starve, so you've got to make sure you leave enough. Okay, we've got another question coming through. Uh, is bee behavior learned or instinctive? Go for it, Tanya. Oh, that's a good question as well. It's actually both. So some bee behavior is like waggle dancing, which is something they use to communicate the direction uh, and the distance to a food source. So bees are actually able to communicate that information they can do that straight away. So they know how to do that instinctively. But bees are also fantastic at learning new things. So they can learn to recognize patterns, they can learn to recognize faces even. Uh, and that's because in order to find food in a landscape where you have lots of different kinds of flowers, you have to be smart enough to remember where the flower is, what sort of nectar it gave you, uh, and how to find your way back. So bees are actually quite clever and able to learn a lot. Um, so it's a mix of some instinctive, some learned behaviors. And they should watch the show because um, there's some, some parts of the show on bees recognising things and how they do that, which is really interesting. Yeah, like mind-blowingly interesting. It, it's yeah. amazing. I mean, it's yeah, so cool. Uh, what will happen if all the honeybees die? Wow. Bee apocalypse. I used to say we'd be naked <laughs> and hungry. Yeah. Um, look, it's, it, if all the honeybees died, there are other pollinators, but a lot of our food would become very, very low quality or very hard to get. So... Um, I, I think we'd be in big trouble. Yeah, so it's a tricky question, isn't it, that yeah. one? There's this quote that floats around saying, 
if B disappeared from the face of the earth, man would have only four years of life left. And it's attributed to Albert Einstein, and it's very yes. terrifying. Albert Einstein never said that. If yeah. you've heard that quote, stop sharing it. It's not a thing. Uh, and if honeybees all died out, yes, we would lose a lot um, of the quality of our produce. But most of our staple crops, <clears throat> excuse me, the things that people get a lot of their calories from, like wheat, potatoes, those things aren't honeybee pollinated. They're not actually bee pollinated Love at all. Love a good cornflake. So, so, you know, I could have cornflakes all year. As long yeah. as you're happy with a boring diet, yeah. Yeah, we'll be right. So it's not the end of the world if the bees were to die out. But having said that, if bees died out, things have gone really off the rails. It would be the end of the world, basically. It would be yeah. pretty awful because bees are a managed species. They're looked after. Yeah. Um, people spend a lot of effort trying to keep them healthy. If they had all disappeared, something's gone really wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it would be very bad. We'd be naked and hungry. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, Annie on Facebook is asking, how much damage do ants do to a hive? Wow. Um, you know, it's, I often get that question asked. like, oh, I've got ants in my hive. And you know, the bees are, for the most part, really good at managing pests. And you'll often find other things living in the beehive happily alongside the bees, like cockroaches, for example. Um, so I don't think it's a big problem. Hmm. But... Ants could overrun a beehive. You don't want to put insecticide around the beehive. Cinnamon works a treat. Yep. So I, I have a bit of a story there. I okay. also research ants, and I researched <laughs> ants before I studied bees. One of my ant colonies actually ate one of my research colleagues' bee colony. So sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it no. can happen. It was a weakened colony, though, and these were invasive species of ant that are known to be really aggressive. But, yeah, it was, it was a bit awkward for a while after that. So you can get some damage, but it's not a common thing that happens. Unless you've got research hives. Unless you've got research hives of, of super ants, yeah. apparently. But the cinnamon, the cinnamon, like I found the cinnamon hmm. works. Is that? Yeah, you can also put um, sticky things like tanglefoot oh, yeah. or even a layer of Vaseline along the edges of the hive. It, it won't necessarily stop all ants, but many ant species are not able to breach that barrier. And that's what we ended up doing to save the remaining hives that time. <laughs> Oops. Uh, Jason is in Sydney. He asks, what are the restrictions for keeping backyard boxes? How do I go about establishing a colony? Okay. So the Department of Primary Industries in New South Wales has some guidelines for keeping bees. And they're like sensible stuff like don't put the beehive in the front yard where people walk past and don't put them, you know, beside a preschool, stuff like that. So have a look at those. Um, join a bee club and get some more advice from there. Um, just think about, it's, it's common sense. So the reason why we don't have beehives in front yards is the bees attack someone and kill them once. <laughs> So it's, it's logical stuff like that. Mm. Um, you've got to register your beehive with the DPI as well. There's big fines if you don't do that. Um, that's about it. There's no yeah. real restrictions. And you can watch the show because we talk all about yeah, that. And you'll get to see amateur beekeepers starting right from the beginning all the way up to towards the end. So watch that. Yeah, totally. But local bee clubs. Ooh, this is a good one. A couple of people have mentioned flow hives. What is your experience of flow hives versus traditional hives? It's just a beehive. <laughs> um, look, flow hives are a great invention, Australian invention. They work just like they say they do. But a lot of people are really anti them. And I guess it's because of the plastic, because they're made of plastic. Mm. In the show, we've got a flow hive as well as the regular beehives. Um, I don't see a problem with them. What's important is that you manage your bees properly so you learn how to look for disease and to keep the bees healthy. The sort of box they're in, not so important. Uh, Monica's question is, what time of year is the best time of year to start a hive? Well, it's spring is the time to start um, because you've got everything beginning in, in sort of the whole insect world, really. Hmm. Um, do ants start in spring? That depends on the species. Some okay. of them are winter active, but a lot of them really pick up in the summer. I mean, I love summer as an insect person. It's yeah. when everything's happening. So spring towards summer is the way to go. Um, it's hard to get bees and to get started after Christmas generally. Um, so spring and leading up to summer. Ah, Leanne's sister asked, ooh, this is a good one, is there any effective Searfid fly invasion prevention for native bees, no. specifically Tetragonula carbonaria and Tetragonula hawkingsi, for new hives when they're in a vulnerable state, for example, a rescued hive from a meter box? Have you had any experience with Searfid fly? I've no? seen them occasionally, but I haven't had to deal with them yet, knock on wood, but I've yeah. heard they can be a pretty nasty problem. They can be a problem. I mean, what I've heard, the things I've heard is to make sure you seal up all the gaps in the beehive to make it mm -hmm. hard for them to lay their eggs. Yep. Um, but I don't know much more than that. Yeah, I mean, that's the best thing that I could say as well. They, yeah. Searfid flies will try to find any crack in the hive, and when you have a rescue hive and you've, or you've recently split, that level, that layer of wax the bees use to seal everything, that's broken. 
So that's when you can get surf and fly in, in particular. But other than that, yeah, I don't know. Again, this is another good reason to join, say, a local beekeeping club or find other stingless bee enthusiasts because a lot of this yeah. stuff is very new. We're just learning how to keep these bees, and those are the people that can get you the help. Okay, so Jody asks, ooh, what is a feral bee? Are honeybees feral? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. So a feral bee is a beehive that's not managed, in the case of European honeybees, is a beehive that's not managed by a beekeeper. So um, if you've got beehives in a box, generally they're managed by a beekeeper. If you've got a beehive living in a tree hollow somewhere, that's not managed and that's a feral beehive. Yeah. So it's important to remember that honeybees were brought to Australia. Um, you know, they're not a native species and so when they get away from being managed, we're not actively looking after them and they're living wild in a tree, then we consider them feral bees. Yeah. Doesn't mean they're bad, it just means mm -hmm. they're feral. Yeah, they're still very important. I yeah. mean, they probably do a lot of pollination, but they're no longer under our human control, so feral. Ah, so Sky asks, are there any online beekeeping groups? I live rurally where there isn't much of anything. Okay. Yes, there are heaps. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook is full of online uh, yeah. beekeeping groups. I'm a member of a uh, female a women in beekeeping group, which is great, very friendly people, always willing to help out. I'm sure there are heaps others. Yeah, a lot of unfriendly groups on Facebook as well. <laughs> Look, Facebook is great. It's the way to go. Um, but there are many, many, many online resources. You've just got to type in beekeeping mm. and you'll get thousands of them. So um, just have a bit of a look around. And some of them can be nasty. So it's funny, on, the online world can be good and bad. So um, if you find a group that's particularly not friendly to mm. beginners, go to another one. Uh, Jordy asks, how many beekeepers test for American fowl brood? Well, everybody should test for American mm. fowl brood. It's a legal requirement. Um, so in New South Wales, at least, it's a legal requirement. I'm pretty sure the other states are the same. Um, twice a year, at least, you should be looking at your beehive for, for American fowl brood. It's really, really important because your beehive could spread it to another beehive, and um, we don't want that. Okay. Uh, Troy asks, I've been considering getting a stingless hive for my courtyard partially trying to get them to pollinate my fruit trees in pots. I live in Brisbane. It gets sun in the morning and at the front of my unit and afternoon sun at the back. Should I go ahead with this or is it not such a good idea? And when should I do it if I should? Ah, so you're thinking about getting a stingless beehive. Um, I mean, it sounds like where you've got should be fine. It's important for the bees not to get too hot, but also not to be too cold. So like any you know, living thing, you've got to try to find that balance. Again, this would be great if you can find somebody locally who you can talk to. Uh, anybody who's rearing stingless bees should be able to talk you through mm. hive placement um, and where the best place in your, your area would be to put them. Uh, as for getting them to pollinate your fruit trees, though, eh, hit and miss. I know I've got a few stingless beehives in my garden. I've got lots of blueberries. I know they go to blueberries in other parts of the country because we go and do work there. They won't go near my blueberries. Got to rack them in the shape. I know. I keep saying, do it. No. But... That's how it is. Stingless bees seem to really like big blooming resources, and so sometimes if you have just a small mm. potted thing, um, they may not do what you like. But they're wonderful bees to have around. They're great to watch, and they will be out there pollinating other things. You tried signs, bees pollinate here. Yeah, oh, please. Just... I've begged them. We, I've pleaded. Doesn't yeah. work. Nope. Yeah. Um, Zara asks, do you always need a queen excluder? No, you don't always need a queen excluder, but I recommend it, especially if you're a beginner beekeeper. Um, only because... Beginner beekeepers seem to be too scared to inspect their beehive. Mm. And so they need to inspect their beehive. And if they don't know where the queen is, they get freaked out and just leave it alone. So with a queen excluder, at least you know where the queen is mm -hmm. and you know where to be extra careful when you're looking. So um, not essential, but I recommend using one. Ah, oh, we have another question. Oh, I love this question. Is queen the wrong word for the egg-laying bee in the hive? I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, do. I don't know. Well, she's not in charge, is she? No. So, you know. so it's interesting because the, the queen honeybee, when we think of a queen, we think of someone who's running the show and doing all the work. The queen honeybee doesn't do anything really other than lay eggs. She's in no way in yeah. charge of what's happening. So in that sense, she's, she's not really a queen. She's more the reproductive parts of the colonies, how I often think of her. But the name queen, I think, is going to stick around, unfortunately. So. Yeah. I mean, all she does is lay eggs, right? So. Yeah, she's an egg-laying machine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is an interesting one. Is it true that bees are clean freaks? Well, <laughs> probably cleaner than I am. <laughs> but, but look, bees have a very, very clean environment inside the beehive, as do many other insects. And they do coat everything in propolis, which is antibacterial. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, mm -hmm. they're clean freaks. 
I think it's important if you're a social animal living with lots and lots of other individuals just like you, you kind of have to be clean. If you're not, yeah. the risk of disease, the risk of parasites just goes straight up. So bees kind of need to be very clean in order to just stay alive. Okay, uh, we've got one more question now. Paolo says hi from Portugal. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How many times should I open it and check my bee box in a year? Well, I don't know much about beekeeping in Portugal, but the rules we have here in Australia is that really you need to check, say, about four times a year as a minimum, and you should be checking for, for disease like American Fowlbred at least twice. But they've got Varroa in Portugal, ah, so yes. this, it could be completely different over there, so you need to get local information. Hmm. So just for those who aren't familiar with Varroa, what yep. is Varroa mate? Um, okay, so Varroa is a parasite that we're the only con continent on Earth without as in Australia, and the parasite decimates bee populations and spreads viruses. It's horrible stuff. So we want to make sure we don't get it. Very important. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. So thank you, everybody, for participating, um, and thank you for sending in your questions. And don't forget to tune in to the Great Australian Bee Challenge, which you can get tonight on ABC TV and iView at 8.30 p.m. So take care for now, and thanks. Bye. See ya.